At some point, at some distant point in our human history, we became conscious of ourselves and we became creative. We began to involve ourselves in what we can only describe as acts of creation. Where did they begin? How did they begin? And in what sense does the phenomenon of the act of creation belong to us today? What are we doing with it? What is history? What does it mean to us? And how can we employ that in increasing our awareness of not only ourselves, but of the world around us? In a way, we could say that human consciousness began in darkness, without light. Some state of being only a tiny bit aware of what was going on, as if in a cave with no light. Indeed, talking of caves, the only art that we have, which came from our very earliest hominid ancestors, can be found inside very, very dark places, caves. But of course, these early hominids, what are we talking about? 20, 30, 40, 50,000 years ago, living in caves, worshipping in caves, didn't make their first art, didn't make their first expressions by braille, by touch. They made it by means of having a relationship between where they were and light. They literally created light, as I'm about to do. This, if you will, represents the first moment of enlightenment in our species. The bringing of light along with our consciousness, and our consciousness using our senses, all of them, even in this dark space, no longer dark, to begin to work out why we were there, what we were doing there, what our surroundings meant to us, and of course, at that very moment, we did something very natural. It's still natural to us today. This consciousness of self meant that we turned in on ourselves, but also, miraculously and beautifully, we turned outwards and looked into the great universal space, the, the infinity of possibility. And that's what they explored. That's why they took elemental materials like this piece of charcoal, this blackened piece of burnt wood, which actually comes from South Uist and the Outer Hebrides, to make drawings of things which they lived with, which were around them. <sighs> of living creatures, a bird, on the wall of a cave. And of course, they used other elements, other inorganic materials, like this piece of ochre, to give it an extra quality of animation and of strength. But that's not all. When we look at, say, the great galleries in Lascaux and the great Portuguese caves, we find not only drawings of birds, bison, horses, lions, we also find very, very strange things like this, We look at these two things and we say pictorialism, reality, organic life, and what's this? What are these abstract signs? Even today, anthropologists are not absolutely sure what these mean. Uh, they were once thought to be mistakes, doodles. Now, we have to accept, remember, the lights are on now. 
Human beings are conscious, they're self-aware, and what they're doing artistically represents what they feel inside, what they sense inside, and what they do with it when they bring it from inside their own perceptions onto a surface like the wall of a cave, or in this case, a piece of paper. Therefore, there is no doubt in my mind whatsoever that the drawing of the bird and the abstract signs are drawings of human consciousness dealing with the very elements, the very foundation of the acts of creation itself. Of course, I'm not suggesting that turning the lights on meant that people could suddenly see, they could see perfectly well. Neither am I suggesting that, that they were deaf and couldn't hear things. There were things to hear and there were things to see. What did happen as a result of being able to do something creative about what they could see was they, I, I have no doubt, again, in my mind, they would have started also thinking, wait a minute, I can create something visual about the cosmos and about where I am and what I am, but what about something sonic? What about sound itself? If you like, the colonisation of silence by invention in the act of creation. And then it happened. They, they didn't just live in a cave. They, they wandered over wild places. They wandered through semi-deserts, through forests, through rocky landscapes. They learned how to swim. They learned how to deal with water. They learned how to deal with fire. But they also learned how to operate with their senses on a, a multifaceted way. And surprise, surprise, they found, for example, in terms of the generation of sound, because they could already hear the sounds that they were making. How? Breathe in. Breathe out. In. Out. These sounds were human generated by the body itself. They could hear the sounds of their digestive systems, of their hearts beating, of birds singing and of rocks tumbling down slopes, and they would pick these rocks up after they'd tumble down in an avalanche, if you like, and realise, just a minute. <laughs> and because they were aware, they must have been aware of the rhythms of nature, of the, the, the chaos of rocks just falling down a slope, but of other things in nature being absolutely irregular. A wind is blowing um, a piece of wood against, against a rock, and it's doing it rhythmically because the wood is tensile and it bends backwards and forwards and goes in no time at all. One thinks they might be starting to think, ah, 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 ah. They were making with their own bodies the first music, with the first instruments, which were get this, organic, inorganic. An extraordinary moment of realising there was an absolute connection between things animate, alive, and things apparently inanimate, apparently dead. And from there, of course, they began to invent other kinds of instruments. This one, for example, just a piece of wood which contains grains of material, probably seeds or something, which produces the sound of rain. They also realised when they saw plants like bamboos which had died, the wind would blow across the top of the bamboo and produce sounds. I also wonder, of course, in, in, in thinking about these things, whether that was it. They just made music and they just made drawings, or they made sculptures, or they made pots. No. Every time we hear sounds, especially rhythmic sounds, we literally have a physical response to it. And that physical response is to begin to make a body response which echoes the rhythm.
even the, even the show, it's broken into pieces. Even the chair is responding to it. You see, I'm just, by accident, I produced a random sonic event. Now, being a curious human being, I think, that's very interesting. It went boom, da 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 boom, da 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 as this fragment hit the table. In no time at all, some primeval composer would have decided boom da 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 boom da 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 boom da 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 was something they could use as a form of self-expression. Living was inevitably continually experimental. And because they needed to touch, to smell, to taste, to look, to hear, to survive, they also needed to use those multi intersensual pieces of apparatus to express their emotional, sensual, reasoning, learning, experimental relationship with the world around them. The act of creation became not an act of creation, but acts of creation. Acts involving all the senses and any materials they could find in the environment around them, both outside and, of course, they became aware, because there's definitely an emotional side to these paintings of birds and even the abstract symbols. These are representing not just a bird outside, they're representing the human being's own inner responses and reactions to these things. This is the, the birthplace, the gynecological ward of creative inventiveness. It's a miracle, but very beautiful. There wasn't a moment, if you like, when creation started. Um, I suppose there was, but, but it was already multifarious. I mean, it wouldn't have been in just one person. A whole mass of, especially when we became social creatures, the interactions would have become multiple. You'd have had multiple acts of creation taking place. And they were literally interactive. But they were not only interactive amongst human generated sound, they were interactive, as I've suggested, with the falling and breaking rocks and the pieces of wood striking rock. They were interactive with all the kind of sensory material that was around them, as I've suggested. But su survival, yes, but also, my goodness, we're talking about entertainment. We're talking about an emotionally guided or guided investigation of our own beings by means of invention. So yes, these, these acts of creation were ongoing. They enabled us probably, because we haven't talked about language yet, they probably ultimately led us towards the need to have not just acoustic signals, but to have a sounding language of our own. If we listen to a child, it's a newborn child, the sounds that they make, they're already exploring um, different ways of shaping sound with their mouths. They're moving their tongues inside their mouths, but they're also moving their fingers. You give a child something it's never seen before, what does it do? Sticks it in its mouth. They touch, they're constantly touching things, they're constantly tasting things. We, we, you may not notice it, but they're sniffing things. Now, these are all, these are part of the firing up of the engine of creation. They are, they're the fuel. Our species uh, is intelligent, and its intelligence fires curiosity. And that curiosity is still with us. Well, is it still there? That is the big, big, big question. Is it still there? Have we still got this terrific primal consciousness? Have we still got lights to turn on? Have we still got the caves to get inside? Are we quite sure we know our place in the cave and the place of the cave in us? Are we quite sure? We haven't lost the act of creation, but I think what we've, we've been imprisoned by, captured by, are what I suppose we could loosely call specialisms. We now have special languages. We have things which we call disciplines. 
uh, we have ways of life which are called vocations, which are about the same as saying designing a motorway through consciousness. Well, you take the M6 to become an architect, and you take the M5 to become a poet, and you take the A373 to become something else. And these are all involving, well, you use the steering wheel and you go down that road. Now, that, that is definitely a disconnect. It's a disconnecting form of act of creation. I believe that what we've demonstrated so far is that everything about our predecessors was connective and connecting and connectable. Why? It's a big question, but it's got a simple answer. Because everything damn well does connect. That's it. I think that we are right at this moment, right at this moment, July 2023, uh, in the 21st century, facing real issues of survival. We're facing a planet in a state of crisis, nature in a state of uh, humanly manufactured corruption and destruction, uh, and human consciousness is inevitably turning towards major issues about life not just inside the cave of one's own home or even one's own county or one's own country, but of the planet, the life of the planet. Now, I don't know in the great halls of academe, the great universities and the great places of scholarship, whether anybody is making any attempts to say, hang on, let's break down this specific discipline-oriented structure of learning and let's start sharing as much different sensory, intellectual, experiential, experimental information and learning as we can. That I'm more sceptical of. I'm, I'm more dubious that if we look to the universities to solve our problem, and by the way, it was universities, I'm talking about the great German universities like the one at Jena, um, towards the end of the 18th century, the, the dawn of a new enlightenment, which talked about the huge potency of not just using learning and scholarship and specific disciplines to understand the world, but to use experience, emotion, and the study of nature, our part in nature and nature's part in us, in order to have a meaningful future. I think we are suffering desperately, the human race is suffering desperately from feeling lost that we're impotent, that we can't make changes. We're surrounded by politics which seems to be populated with lies, with deception, hegemony, patronization, corruption. We're surrounded by religions in a state of crisis because people are asking, where's God in all this? And we've lost some of the great anchors of human consciousness. What have we lost? We've lost the sucker of Mother Nature. Now, I think more people are turning towards it. I hope it's not just the youth. I think that in as much as the, the youth of our time is sometimes complaining, as one notoriously and very powerful and interesting young lady is doing and blaming the older generation, the older generation has not lost its capacity for invention. Indeed, we should be applauding those people of older generation who have the experience to st simply say, We've been where it was good. We've been where there were more birds, more flowers, where there was less population, where there was less oppression. We had those times. We want them just the same as you young ones do. Now, if that happens, there is a possibility for us. But it's going to mean, actually, not an evolution. It's going to mean a revolution. We're going to have to revolve our consciousness between being incestuously and compulsively and obsessively involved in congratulating ourselves in our own wisdom and delight of our time, but to look back in time and above all, through acts of creation, to look into a future where we might, just might, survive. But without that change, without that revolution, it ain't gonna happen.